Well, good morning, Harvest. <laughs> we are glad you're here. You, uh, you did set your clocks ahead, so good job, good job. <laughs> so welcome. Let's begin worshiping on this wonderful Sunday morning. Would you stand with us as we open with all hail the power of Jesus' name. a minute to greet one another and then have a seat for our announcements.
It's a beautiful day outside. Did anybody get out and do anything yesterday? <laughs> you did? <laughs> Me too. But so, yeah, my husband kind of said, if we're going to do this today, we need to do it. And I said, well, you guys have to warm up some more. <laughs> I cannot go outside. <laughs> okay, so announcements for today is there is no children's church this morning. Um, and then uh, we have no kids' kids and no youth group this week because of spring break. So please make sure you remember those things. Um, our Thrive Conference is still on its way, March 23rd to Saturday. Um, if you know anyone who is near retirement or even looking for kind of what's going on after those things, that's, this is the conference to come to. Um, another thing with VBS. Sorry, Dave, am I going too fast? <laughs> um, VBS is now scheduled. It'll be June 3rd through the 7th. And Lucy, where's Lucy at? It's going to be stellar, Lucy. It's about outer space and things. I think you'll love it. <laughs> um, okay, we also have um, our women's conference. And I want to kind of share with you. Um, so Jaleesa and I, of course, went to this conference, and it's something that we've covered in a couple years. And this year, um, in its 10th anniversary, they decided to um, kind of legalize a lot of things or make things a little bit harder for us to uh, um, support this, and so I was talking to the elders yesterday, and last Monday we got the news about what we needed to do and not do, and so we decided to postpone. We are going to do our conference. It's called Desperate for Jesus. It is with um, Oak Cliff Bible Church down in Texas. That is Tony Evans Church. Um, this past spring, or actually fall, um, our ladies did Kingdom Woman, and these two women are also part of that, and so it's Priscilla Schreier and her sister Crystal. Um, we don't have all the details, but I did get the go-ahead to go ahead and register. So July 26th and 27th is when we're going to have this. And I, I really am been in prayer for that. Um, it was a tough week last week knowing that I wasn't going to be able to do this conference. But God has a reason for all of that. And so we just have to follow and obey and trust him. And that's what I'm doing. And so, the, like I said, July 26th and 27th, um, we'll have more details coming as they come open. Well, that, uh, last couple of things is um, Palm Sunday is coming, and so um, hopefully you guys can make it to that. And then um, there is Easter plans also that um, the elders have shared with me. There is going to be a breakfast and Easter egg hunt. I believe we're starting at 8.30. So I think that's it, and I'm going to turn this over to Brett. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have one other announcement to share with you guys. Uh, this year we're going to do our first uh, Seder meal. And that's going to be on Good Friday at 6 o'clock. Um, so Passover and Seder is time just that the Jewish culture would celebrate kind of with their flight from Egypt and also about remind themselves of their slavery that they had and how they, God provided for them. So we kind of go get our hearts and minds ready for that time since that reminds us of how Jesus was the sacrificial lamb for all of us. So just one of those things for you guys to think about. Um, we're kind of excited about it. I know Brian and I are going to kind of come, come up with some ideas. So we'll see how it goes. But just want to let you guys know. Yeah, so our month is very full, so be uh, reading through your newsletter when it comes to you so that you can be reminded of all the things. And uh, so, yeah, the, uh, what Brett was talking about, that's something new. Uh, we, as a church, traditionally, we haven't been doing anything on Good Friday. That's kind of been our tradition, but this year we wanted to do something uh, just, you know, to assist us in that preparation for Easter. And so we're going to be focusing on this Seder meal. So what, what it is, is it, it's a sit-down time to come together. We're going to eat, but the food all has significant meaning, okay? And that significant meaning pre helps prepare us for Easter morning. Okay. Well, let me help you in preparing your hearts. Uh, our hearts need to be in tune of who God is. And Psalm 99, the opening verses, does a great job of preparing us with the proper perspective as we worship. So here are the words of the psalmist. He begins by saying this, The Lord reigns. Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. The king is mighty. He loves justice. 
you have established equity. In Jacob, you have done what is just and right. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Let's pray together. Lord, this morning as we gather here at church, we're in many ways gathering before your throne. Um, We have come not to fulfill any desire of our own, but rather to focus on the God who deeply cares about us, who loves us, who desires the best for us. And so, Lord, we come before you, and Lord, we desire to come with a proper attitude and perspective. And as the psalmist has has said, you are holy. Lord, we know that you are perfect, and all your ways and the way you accomplish things, they are perfect. And so, Lord, we come knowing that you are the only God and that you deserve our honor and praise. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll ask you to stand with us. The first song we're going to sing is called His Mercy is More, and it really focuses on... The idea that we have many sins, but God's grace is more merciful than anything we could do. One of my favorite lines in here is that God takes our sins and he he throws them into the sea without bottom or shore. Like it says, Christ removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. So this song is speaking about uh, God's mercy. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more.
hopefully you'll go home with that chorus in your mind. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is new. We're going to do another new one called Only a Holy God, and we're going to follow that up by singing the hymn Holy, Holy, Holy. commands all the hosts of heaven who else can make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises what other splendor be seated for announcements. I mean for offering.
All right, if you would pray with me, we'll dedicate the offering this morning. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you are holy and that you are who you are. Father, we thank you for your provision for us. Lord, we pray that you would use these funds to further your kingdom. Lord, we, that we would share your light and your gospel here in Goodland. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Young people for our children's message, so come on up here. Come on up and have a seat up front here. Helmet of what? Salvation. salvation. You're right. Yep. The helmet of salvation. Oh, okay. Well, good, good. So, yeah, as you know, we've been talking about the armor of God, and we began with the belt of truth, and we talked about a breastplate of righteousness. Um, then we were instructed to take up the uh, or put on our shoes, which were called the gospel of peace, and we then, the yeah, we did the shoes. Yeah, I brought some, well, cinnamon, or not cinnamon, cuff, we brought, well, I guess it was cinnamon shoes, weren't they? Yeah. Okay, yep. And then we had the shield of faith. You guys remember that one for sure, right? Yeah. That was pretty cool. And uh, so today is the helmet of salvation. Next Sunday is... The sword of the Spirit. And I got a sword coming. You, you're not going to want to miss it. Huh? Is it real? Yep. Is it Katana? Well, I don't know that. It's metal. I <laughs> don't. Katana? A Katana is like a crucifix. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not sure. It's, but it's pretty legit, meaning it's real. Well, anyhow, but today is the helmet of salvation, and so we are told that we need to put on the helmet of salvation, and so what is that all about, okay? Well, you put on a helmet, what does the helmet do for us? Protects your brain. Yeah, protects your brain. It only doesn't protect your face. Well, this one does. But it's for your brain, yeah, and what? What happens with our brain? What what do we use our brain the for? Microphone. Yeah. Can't get it back up. So what do we use our brain for? You guys know? What do you use your brain for? For thinking. For thinking. Did you hear that? For thinking. For yeah. Controlling your heart. Yeah. So Well, I think you're probably right. So our thinking affects everything. So if you are thinking sad things, do you feel very good? No, you don't. And if you are you if you think right, yeah. Or uh huh. Or if you think of something scary, what does that do? You laugh. What is it? You think makes you afraid, scary things, yeah. So, yeah. So, so thinking is very important, okay. And if we're gonna remember, remember we talked about we're fighting against an enemy out there. He doesn't want us to succeed. He wants he wants us to fail, and that's the devil. He's a naughty guy. He doesn't want good things to happen for us. So, so, so God says, well, one of the things I want you to do as you fight the devil and fight other things is you need to put this helmet on, okay? In other words, you need to protect your thinking because if you're not thinking right, well, then that affects everything. So thinking is so important. We got to think right. And so that's why God says, I want you to put on the helmet of salvation. In other words, I want you to think right, okay? Now, I got something that'll help you think right. Yeah, so this thinking right, I got a song for you, and you guys know this song. 
because this song is all about thinking right. And it's the song, Jesus Loves Me. Do you guys know that one? In fact, I'm going to have all of you guys, church, I want you to sing with me. But uh, because I think this little song kind of really summarizes proper thinking. So, you guys know it too, right? Jesus Loves Me. Uh, yes. So we're going to sing that together. Right. Okay, so let me start it, you guys. Okay, we're going to all start together, okay? You guys ready to sing it? Because that talks about proper thinking. Okay, here we go. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. He loves you, right? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus. Why does he love you? Tells me so. So that's proper thinking, okay? Jesus loves me, and why do I know that he loves me? It's based on the Bible tells me so. So that's all part of your right thinking. So when you guys are afraid or you're sad... Uh, I want you to remember the song, Jesus Loves Me, because Jesus Loves Me, that song helps you think the right way. The truth is, Jesus loves you, and how do we know Jesus loves us? Because the Bible tells me so. See, that's right thinking, basing everything on the Bible. So Jesus says, put on the helmet of salvation. I want you to think right. And one of the ways we can think right, a real simple way, is remembering Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so. Okay? It is. Yeah. Fits on my head, and I got a big head. Good. All right, guys. You were good. Uh, Mrs. Fugelberg, Nancy has candy there so you can go over this way and grab something for candy remember there is no children's church so come on over get your piece of candy and then you can go back and sit down Well, for the rest of you this morning, moms and dads and grandparents and those who are here, I want you to join me in the book of Ephesians as we continue to talk about the armor of God. We're in a series, as you remember, called Being an Overcomer. And we are overcomers because God has made, has made it possible to be overcomers because of the armor of God. And so we'll be talking, of course, about the armor of God. And today, especially, we get to speak about the helmet of salvation. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, the helmet of salvation. So what we're going to do, we're going to begin reading again here in Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, we begin in reading in verses 10 through 12. And so what I'll do, I'll read through verses 10 through 12, and then we'll uh, pause there, and I'll bring some comments to you, okay? And... Uh, here we have the battle for us being spoken of, and again, that's Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. So let's talk about uh, putting on the armor of God, and the reason we need the armor of God is because of these verses. Here's what it says. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And why do we need this armor of God? Well, the devil schemes, one. Number two, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and, the, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, he is the guy who penned these words, and he is telling the believer, you are in a battle. Okay, and he's talking to you. Because you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are in a battle. It's a spiritual battle. It's not something that we actually see, but 
it does exist, a spiritual battle. Let me share a couple of other verses that uh, kind of explains a little bit more about this battle. And first of all, I want to have you look at Ephesians chapter 2. And here's what it says. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And here's where I want you to listen. And the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now, the reason I wanted to share this verse with you is because here we see that there is a ruler in this world, and we talked about the various, uh, I guess, um, battlefields that we must fight. Remember, we fight against Satan, and we fight against the world, and of course, the world is that system of philosophy or beliefs or those ideologies that are contrary to what God has said. That's what we're fighting. That's the world. And then also, we are fighting personally our own flesh. Okay, that sinful nature that wants to do wrong. We know what to do, what is right, but then sometimes our fleshly nature gets the best of us, gets the better of us. But so anyhow, those are our battle fronts. Those are, that's where we're fighting. And the ruler of those things right now is Satan himself. He is the ruler the king, in the kingdom of the air. And it says the spirit of the enemy is at work in those who are disobedient. And I'll kind of reference that in just a few moments. But what I want you to see here, we are in a spiritual battle. Uh, There is a ruler, and he's a bad guy. That is the enemy, Satan himself. And he somehow has influence on people. The spirit of of the evil one is at work, and people are disobedient. So that's Ephesians 2. Now let's go to John 8. It says this, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And so we have a very good description of the enemy. He is a liar. He's also a murderer, it tells us. And we see in the beginning of this, verse 44, that there are people that follow him. They belong to the Father, it says. This was Jesus' words. You belong to your father, the devil. He's a liar and a murderer, and that's what you do, and that's who you are as well, he says. And he was speaking to the religious elite of his time in that soul. So here we have we have the, the ruler of the kingdom of, air, of the air. His spirit is at work in people so that they are disobedient. Um, He is a murderer, it tells us also, and he is a a liar. He does not speak the truth. And uh, that's the kind of uh, environment that we are living in as followers of Jesus Christ. And it's all because of what Satan is doing. Now, I want to share some things with you. Here's here's just some uh, realistics, some of the reality that we are facing that I believe is part of this spiritual battle. Now, and and a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense to me, but it's out there. For instance, gender confusion. I I don't get that. Why somebody says, well, I'm I'm a woman, not a man. I mean, I don't get that stuff, okay? It's hard for me to get my mind wrapped around that. And then we see this rise of lawlessness. Why would you go and destroy your neighborhood, smashing the storefront windows and breaking down the door? I don't get that. That just doesn't make sense to me. So the rise of lawlessness, the the glorification of immorality. You know, what I don't get it. Why would somebody glorify putting on women's clothing and dancing and all that? I don't get that stuff, okay? Uh, this rejection of truth. Okay, what, is, what was called bad now is called good. That which we knew was wrong, now they say is right. That's what Scripture tells us. You see that in Isaiah chapter 5. So this rejection of truth. Um, and then this practice of deception. We've been in a series in Matthew. In Matthew 24, Jesus says, hey, I want to tell you guys in the last days there's going to be deception. Okay, So be alert. Be, be forewarned. There's going to be lots of deception. And so, like I said, these things I just, I, I wrestle with. I don't, I don't get it. 
Why, why do people want to change what God made them? Why do you want to be a, a woman or, or a man, you know? Or, or why do you want to destroy property? What, what benefit is that to you? These things just don't seem to make sense until, okay, until I put it in that category that we are in a spiritual battle. So when I can look at these things through the lens of the Bible, they begin to kind of make sense. The enemy out there, Satan, his spirit is at work in people so that they do disobedience, okay? People are destroying, people are killing one another because, because they are following the father of this world, so to speak, when we're talking about Satan here, because he is a murderer and he is deceitful and he is a liar. And so that's what we are up against, okay? I don't know if you're in my camp where I don't get it, okay? Maybe you're wrestling too. I just don't get it. But when you look at it through the lens of Scripture, we see that the enemy does have ruling taking place. He is in control of this world, and he's doing some things that just are wrong, okay? Why are people doing these things? Because they are listening to the voice of Satan and so forth, and the spirit of of the enemy is at work. And so when we understand that, okay, that's the kind of battle we're against. That's what's going on. That's my battle. I'm fighting the enemy because he's doing these crazy things. So you need to get ready. You need to put on your armor because that's the battle you're in. That's, those are the things that are re real that we have to deal with. And uh, we, we want to be ready for them. And so God says, put on your armor. Now, let's go back to our passage here. We talked about this spiritual battle that we're in. Um, let's go to verse uh, 13 through 18. So how do we uh, fight this battle that we're in? It doesn't make sense. How do we fight it? Well, he says this, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with your belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always, keep e and always keep on praying for the saints. So we're in a spiritual battle. Like I said, it doesn't make sense to me until I put it through the grid of Scripture. We see that the enemy has sway in the lives of people, and that's why they're doing this crazy, out-of-this-world stuff. And how do we deal with it? Well, we're supposed to equip ourselves with the armor. And so we just looked at it. We are to put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. We need to fit our feet with the gospel of peace, and we take up the shield of faith, and then also we're going to talk about the helmet of salvation. So those are the, the elements of our armor that we are to take on. Now, what does that exactly look like? Okay, um, we get the picture. We've seen the pictures of the soldier with his breastplate of righteousness and his shield of faith. Okay, we get the picture, but how does that practically work in our lives? And so that's what I want to talk about at this point. So we fight uh, the enemy and this spiritual battle in, in two ways. Practically, we fight it, and positionally, we fight it. And that, this is important to understand. We, we fight this battle in a practical way, but also because of our position in Jesus Christ. That also helps us fight. Now, practically, remember, in a practical way, we were told to put on the, the belt of truth, all right? Now, understand, there is a practical aspect of this piece of armor, and there is a positional aspect of this armor. And it's true for the breastplate of righteousness. There is a practical aspect, and there is a positional aspect of it. Even with the, the gospel of peace and the shield of faith, again, there's a practical side that we need to be aware of and apply, and there's also a positional um, part 
And we're going to talk about that. So, first of all, practical. We said we put on the belt of truth. What was the practical? Well, we need to know the truth. That's the practical. So practical is, you know, I spend time reading God's Word. And uh, why do I do that? Well, I want to know my Savior. That's why I'm reading. I want to know what he, what he desires of me as far as how to live. That's why I read Scripture. But as we're seeing today, you know, I'm in a battle, and I want to be an overcomer. How do I fight in this battle? What do I do to fight? I put on the truth, the belt of truth, which is knowing God's Word. So that's the practical aspect, okay? That's the practical. The breastplate of righteousness, it has a practical thing too. How do I put on my pra- uh, the breastplate of righteousness? How is that pra- practical? What do I do? Well, you just do the next right thing. It's just making a right decision. And that protects you in this battle. So if you make a decision to steal, well, you know the consequence. Then you end up in jail or you get fined or whatever. There's, always, there's a consequence. But if you choose not to steal doing what is right, then you're protected. You're protected because you made the right decision. So the breastplate of righteousness, the practical part of it is just doing the right thing. Then we put on the feet, on our feet, the gospel of peace. And uh, we talked about that is where, I mean, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ is one of uh, the things that we can do to fight in this battle because it's wonderful if somebody will understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, what has happened is we've seen a transfer take place. The enemy has lost a foot soldier to do his nasty work, and God has a child, has a daughter or a son who is living for him and will experience life eternal. So Satan loses when the gospel is shared. So that's a practical aspect of this fight. And then we're to take up the shield of faith. The shield of faith practically is this, walking with God, trusting His promises, and leaning on the people of God. We talked about how, um, if you remember, we talked about the Roman soldier. The, the uh, shield, there are two, two types of shields. One was kind of a smaller, round one, like the size of a trash can, which is very portable, that they could use to fight and, and deflect uh, spears and arrows and stuff like that. But then there's also in the Roman army this big shield that was two and a half feet wide and four foot tall. And I don't know if you remember the image. We saw an image where the soldiers kind of locked all those shields together and it formed kind of a fortress where those who were within uh, the boundaries of the shield with inside that, that fortress of shields, they were protected. And so the application of that, of that is, you know, part of our faith is we need each other. Because of your faith, I am encouraged, all right? Because you've been through a struggle in this battle and you were victorious, I see that in your life and I am encouraged and I can take, uh, you know, encouragement that I can too win in this battle. So what we find out, practically speaking, with the shield of faith is that we need one another. And that helps us be victorious in this battle to be an overcomer. So what we've been talking about is just that practical aspect. So remember, there is the practical aspect of the armor of God, things that we can do, all right? But also I want you to understand there is a positional aspect of the armor of God. And so let's just spend some time explaining what this positional is. Now back to the belt of truth. Uh, Positionally, the belt of truth we talked about is being having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Okay? So positionally, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. Remember the belt of truth? He is the truth and the life. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. So having a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is your position. You, are, you belong to the king. Okay? You are the king. You are a daughter or a son of the king. That is your position, and we gain strength from knowing that. That does not change. Uh, Positionally, the breastplate of righteousness. Um, You are looked upon as being righteous. That is your position in Jesus Christ. When you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, um, a legal transaction took place. The righteousness of Jesus Christ 
was credited to your account. Okay? So when the books are looked at, you know, does this individual have any IOUs or any debts? When they look at your book, they say, no. What I do see is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So, here, I brought my sunglasses. So when God looks down at you because of your relationship with Jesus Christ, God looks through the lenses of Jesus Christ and his completed perfect work on the cross. And when he looks through that lens, what Jesus has done, and looks at you, okay, he's looking at you and he sees you as righteous. Because he is looking first through the cross, what Jesus Christ has done. He's looking through that. And when he sees you, he sees that you are righteous. You are righteous. That's your position in Jesus Christ. You are declared righteous, positionally, all right? That's important to know. Then there's the feet that are fitted with the gospel of peace. Um, Positionally, um, that refers to your salvation. And what we spent time doing when we talked about our position in Jesus Christ what we did is we went back to Ephesians chapter 1. And you might want to do that sometime later, just read through that. But positionally, because of your faith in Jesus Christ, you heard the gospel, okay? The gospel of peace came to you. You accepted it. And of course, the great benefit of accepting the gospel is eternal life, right? That's wonderful. But that's not the complete package. Here's what, all, here's what else you received when you trusted in Jesus Christ. Yes, eternal life, but based on Ephesians chapter 1, you were also chosen. That's who you are. You're chosen. You've been redeemed. Uh, You've been forgiven. You are now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And as we came to the end of that section of verses in chapter 1, it says you are God's possession. Okay? That's positionally. That's who you are. You're forgiven. You're redeemed, okay? The Holy Spirit resides in you. It's a guarantee of your inheritance, it says there, having the Holy Spirit. That's your guarantee of your inheritance in heaven. Um, You are God's possession. That's positionally, all right? All because of the gospel. And then we talked about the shield of faith. Uh, And faith is just, you know, basically simple faith in God. And here's, here's your position. He says in Matthew 28, 20, when he sent out the, the disciples, okay, here are your marching orders. I want you to go and make disciples of all nations. And he says this, and understand this, I am with you always to the very end of the age. That is your position, okay? You, God is always with you. That doesn't change. That's your position, okay? And so, like I said, we need to know our position in Christ as we enter into this battle because it supports us. It sustains us knowing our position. And now that leads us to verse 17 where we talk about we are to take up the helmet of salvation. And uh, let's see if we can't bring this together for more clarity. So look at it there, verse 17. It says, the helmet of salvation. The helmet here is not suggesting that you must be saved. So Paul, when he was writing about the armor of God, you know, take up the belt of truth and the the breastplate of righteousness and the shield of faith and so forth, and he says, also take up the helmet of salvation. He is not at this point saying, okay, what you need to do is you need to get saved, okay? You need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not what he's talking about here. That has already taken place in your life. Understand, Paul here is addressing Christians. He's already addressing believers. He's talking to people who have understood what Jesus has done for them, and therefore they have accepted Christ. So these people are already believers. They are already saved. So this is not talking about salvation. Um, What Paul is saying, he says, since you already are a follower of Jesus, you are at war. Understand that. Therefore, Make preparations to do battle, he wants. And so what are some of this preparation? Well, he says, put on the helmet of salvation. So what is this really referring to? Well, the helmet of salvation is referring to, he's talking about a mind of preparation. That's what he's talking about. Put on the helmet of salvation. In other words, prepare your mind. 
You see, a significant aspect of making yourself ready for battle is right thinking. Right thinking is so crucial when as you battle the enemy. Now, for example, in the Garden of Eden, step back with me to the beginning of the Bible back in Genesis. Um, God has created a wonderful garden, the Garden of Eden, and he placed Adam and Eve in this garden. And he gave some specific instructions to Adam and Eve. He said to them, okay, here's what. You know, you can eat from any tree in this garden. That's totally fine, he says. But there is one tree I don't want you to touch or eat from. And that is the tree that is called the knowledge of good and evil. That tree, knowledge of good and evil, stay away from it. But all the other trees, the umpteen hundreds of trees, you can, you can enjoy. But just that one don't touch it. Stay away from it. Well, then the story goes on. Satan comes into the picture, the serpent, the evil one, and he has this question for Eve. Did God really say that? See, Satan messed with Eve's mind. You see that? He caused Eve to doubt God's word. So at the very beginning, the enemy is attacking, attacking Eve's thinking. Thinking is so important when we battle the enemy. That's why he says, I want you to take up the helmet of salvation. I want you to prepare your mind for this battle because your right thinking in this battle is going to sustain you and help you become an overcomer. So it's very important to have the right kind of thinking. Um, so Satan, but he's going to attack you, and he's going to have you doubting. That's, what he's, that's one of his strategies, get you doubting. And he hasn't changed. I mean, he continues to work very hard at making you doubt. And here's some of the areas he's going to make you doubt. All right? He's going to says he will make you doubt the truth of the Bible. Is, you know, is this really God's word or is this some um, uh, outdated old book, you know, that, uh, that I'm trying to follow? I mean, you see the doubt there? That's what Satan does. He will make you doubt your forgiveness. He'll say to you, you know what? You, you committed a nasty sin there, and God does not forgive that. See, he starts doing this doubt, doubting game with you. Uh, he will also challenge you regarding your salvation. He wants you to doubt your salvation. So the helmet here this morning is a reminder that your battle, your battle effectiveness is connected to your knowledge. Right thinking brings victory to your life. Therefore, put on the helmet of salvation. You got to engage in right thinking as you battle and fight the enemy. And here's your spiritual takeaway as you leave today, I want you to say, your right thinking is connected to your position in Christ. Now, we spend a lot of time, at least I spend a lot of time, trying to, to explain that there's a practical aspect of our armament, and there's the positional part of our armament. And I want, what I want you to do is I want you to focus, uh, not neglect practical, but always fall back on that position, your position in Jesus Christ. That, that is so important. Let's see if we can make it. Uh, let me give me some. I'll give you some examples. For example, Satan says you are a dirty, rotten scoundrel. Okay, I'm trying to use Grandma Sue's terminology here. You're a dirty, rotten scoundrel. God can't forgive you because you're just too rotten. Well, that lie doesn't rock your world, for you know that you are righteous in God's eyes. Positionally, remember, we go back to the position. God's righteousness has been imputed to you, placed on your account. When God looks down at you, he's looking through his lenses, which are what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. He's looking through that lens, and he sees you as being righteous. So yeah, Satan may attack me, and yeah, to a point, you know, I am a dirty, rotten scoundrel. But my position is not affected by what Satan is saying. I am still the righteous one of God, okay? Okay, Satan will say, hey, you are not saved. You're, you're, 
you know, your salvation, that's not real. Uh, and he'll say, you know, you know how I know that? Because when you were in the restaurant, you were embarrassed to bow your head and pray. And because you were embarrassed to do that, you're not saved. Uh, this is Satan talking, all right? Okay. Or um, maybe there was something you just you knew it wasn't right. You know, the way of the world is going a certain direction. And you know it's not right, but you didn't stand up and say, no, I'm not going that way, okay? I'm not thinking that way. What you're saying is completely wrong. I mean, you wanted to say those things, but you didn't. And Satan, he caught on and he says, see, you're not really saved. You don't belong to God because you couldn't even take a stand. You had no courage. And so, psh, you're not saved. Again, that's a lie that Satan throws at you. But because you are belonging to Jesus Christ, you don't get upset about what he may be trying to get you to think and doubt because you know that your position is secure in Jesus Christ. The Bible makes it clear that when you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and this is from Ephesians chapter 1, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. So you took up your helmet of salvation, you put it on and say, hey, you know, Satan, you may be right there. You know, I did kind of coward there and I didn't speak the truth or whatever. I didn't want conflict, whatever the reason is. And you're trying to tell me that I don't belong to the Lord. Well, it's not what I do that makes me right with God, okay? I'm right with God because of what Jesus Christ has done. I'm in his family. And because I may not act like it sometimes, it still does not change my position. Truth does not change. I still belong to him. I've been given the Holy Spirit. Okay? So take the helmet of salvation who reminds you to uh, rest in your position. The helmet is instructing you to go back to the scriptural knowledge that we have regarding our position in Christ. So here is your knowledge. Okay, well, I'm going to give you your knowledge. This is, this is your helmet of salvation, remember? Right thinking. Let me give you some right thinking. You can fight with confidence, anticipating victory, for you have the belt of truth around your relationship, or around your waist. What I'm talking about here is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. Okay? You are victorious because you have entered into a relationship with, with Jesus Christ, and that will not change, okay? That's your position. The breastplate of righteousness. Jesus has given me his righteousness. He's given you his righteousness. Your sins are forgiven, and you are in a right relationship with God. Again, not based on what you have done, but what Christ has done. That's your position, okay? And your position needs to be part of your thinking as you fight the enemy. We're told here, my feet are fitted with the gospel of peace. Your feet are fitted with the gospel. You have peace because you have, you have more than just fire insurance. You're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you have peace. And what, what, do we, what do we learn? What comes from having a relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, here's what comes, and this is part of our thinking. I am chosen. I am loved. I am redeemed. I am forgiven. I am a recipient of His grace. The Holy Spirit lives in me, guaranteeing my inheritance. I am God's possession. Okay? That's your position. And your position is to influence your thinking. It's so important to think right when we, we're in this battle because Satan will be attacking us. But our position remains constant all the time. Then last, we have, we have that shield of faith. Remember that? Take up your shield of faith. My Father is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That never changes. He is my Father, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what we stand behind. That is our shield. And again, that is our position. My Father is with me always. And therefore, I am an overcomer. So position. Put on the helmet of truth. Or the helmet of salvation. What is this helmet of salvation? What I'm proposing to you, your helmet of salvation is your right thinking. And your position in Jesus Christ 
is to guide your thinking. And so when you're thinking right, you experience victory in this spiritual battle. So take up the helmet of salvation. Think right as you follow Christ. Well, let's wrap it up here. And let me give you a benediction. Would you stand with me and let me speak some words of truth over you? Harvest. Because of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to be attacked. Satan's primary objective is to make you doubt. Do not be shaken, but rather stand with confidence. Put on your helmet of salvation. Put on right thinking. And let these truths guide your thoughts. You've been chosen. You are loved. You've been redeemed and forgiven. You are a recipient of God's grace. The Holy Spirit lives in you, which is a guarantee of your future inheritance. You are God's possession. These truths never change, nor are they taken away. Stand firm. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated.